So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depends on where you, you are in the world. So welcome today for a new cast talk. So today is my turn to give a talk. And uh, today uh, we have uh, Dr. Giancarlo Abis as the session chair. And uh, But today it's my time, as I told you, to do a presentation. So I give the floor now to Dr. Giancarlo Abish to do the introduction. Hello, everybody. We are live today for another weekly cast talk. Today we have uh, Professor Ricardo Hayes presenting physical design from past to future. Professor Hayes has an extensive and recognized CV. Uh, he received a bachelor degree in electrical engineering from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, Porto Alegre, in 1978 and a PhD degree in microelectronics from National Polytechnic Institute of uh, Grenoble, French, in 1983. The, he received a uh, doctor honoris causa by the University of Montpellier in 2016. He is a full professor at the Informatics Institute of uh, Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. His main research includes physical automation, design methodology, and auto learning systems. He has more than, seven, than, than 700 publications, including books, journals, and conferences. He was uh, vice president of IFI, International Federation of Information Processing, and he was also president of Brazilian Computer Society, two terms. And, uh, Vice President of Brazilian Microelectronic Society. He received in uh, 2016 the ITER IEEE uh, CAST uh, Meritorious Service Award. He also was Vice President of CAST for two terms. He is a founder of several conferences like SPCCI and LASCAS. The uh, CAS flagship conference in Region 9. He was the general program chair of several conferences like ITOE, SBLSI, SBCCI, IPB, LSI, SOC, ISEC, FATMOS, and among others. Uh, Ricardo was the chair of IPB, ITOE, VLSI, SOC Society. PC chair of the IPWG uh, 10.5 and chair of, of IPPC 10. In 2002, he received the researcher, the researcher of the Year Award in the state of Rio Grande do Sul. He is a founding member of the SBC, Brazilian Computer Society, and also founding member of SB Micro, Brazilian Microelectronic Society. He was member of CAS DLP program for two terms, and he has done more than 80 invited talks in conference. Member of uh, IEEE CAS Board of Governors and IEEE CDA Board of Governors. Uh, member of IEEE IoT Initiative Activity Board, Chair of the IEEE CAS SIG, and on IoT, Ricardo received the IFIP Fellow Award and the 2022 ACM ESPD Lifetime Achievement Award. So thanks, Professor Ricardo, for giving this talk today. Thank you, Jam. So, uh, so today uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, physical design, starting by some observations that uh, we got by doing some reverse engineering in the past and then uh, considering new challenges uh, and new uh, trends based on this. Now. So, um, uh, this uh, talk today is an extended version of an invited talk done at ISPG 2022, the ACM International Symposium of Physical Design. You see here the web page. So, there is a, a paper related to this invited talk that uh, was published in uh, ACM Digital Library. So, um, and uh, I think it's also available in IEEE 
explore. So uh, there is some considerations that are related to to this uh, talk. So starting by remembering the past, uh, I start my uh, let's say uh, uh, learning on microelectronics uh, after some preliminary studies uh, here in Brazil, uh, doing the reverse engineering of uh, the microprocessor uh, Zilog 8000. So this experience was done uh, in France, and uh, it was related to the studies of the DEA, the Diploma of uh, Estude Approfondi, a kind of uh, master at that time. So, um, then uh, I took a set of uh, photos. Uh, it's not uh, exactly this one you are seeing here, no? But uh, then I was able to observe a lot of uh, details of the, uh, the microprocessor. Uh, one issue that you can see here is that uh, the Zilog 8000 uh, is a classical uh, architecture based on uh, control flow. So there is a data path where the data is uh, uh, transformed and also uh, where the data is uh, uh, available in the registers of this uh, microprocessor. It has uh, 20 general registers in this data path. Uh, you can see by this block in the middle, in the top, that is more dark. No? This is the, the register. And also about, uh, let's say, uh, almost three-thirds of the, the surface was used for the control part. So uh, this was very interesting. So I can uh, already tell some of the observations we have done after doing the reverse engineering uh, is that uh, uh, they were very clever when uh, they have defined this architecture. So they used the same uh, approach that was used to develop the RISC microprocessor, so reduction instruction set computer that time uh, when they have done simulations to see the exact uh, density of use of each uh, machine instruction. So there is some uh, instructions of the microprocessor that are used a lot, appear in very often, and some others that ap appear just very few times. So in the RISC microprocessor, the idea was to uh, take out these instructions uh, from the set of instructions, doing it by firmware, and then reducing the set of instructions. Uh, the control part was smaller and then faster. So this is one of the reasons that uh, uh, there was a huge move uh, for the developing of uh, RISC microprocessors. So here they based on the same approach that is the simulation of the how frequent was the use of each instruction. And then they decided to do another solution. They saw that four instructions were responsible for about uh, more than 40% of the instruction use. So then they define a very small control part to take care of these four instructions. And the other instructions were managed by a second control part. So they have two control parts. And uh, uh, these four instructions, uh, they put a, a code. They use a code where the two more significant bits were one. So just uh, one NAND gate was possible to identify if the next instruction was one of these four instructions, and then the small control part that takes care only of these four instructions was activated, and the other one was disactivated. So uh, as this small control part takes care of only four instructions, 
Uh, it was very small and very fast. So this was the main reason that uh, the speed of this 8,000 at that time was really impressive. Uh, uh, so, uh, and uh, it was using uh, any MOS technology, 3.5 uh, microns that time, with just one metal layer. But if you go deep here to see the photos more in detail, we can see that uh, the density was really impressive. Uh, another observation is that all this, uh, um, the layout of this microprocessor was done by hand. So the computer was used at time just to uh, design rectangles or polygons, but there was no automation, nothing to generate the cells. There was no cell library. Uh, and uh, we can uh, observe this also as the same function, for example, an end, uh, depending where the end was placed, the design of the end gate was different. Not only the position of the transistor, but also the size. So they were able to uh, have a very large set of uh, sizing of uh, these transistors and gates. So uh, it was really interesting to observe how it was done and uh, the huge compaction that was done in this uh, control part. So uh, I don't know any other processor that uh, has the same approach in dividing the control part in two parts, uh, like it was done in the C8000. So here is a detail of one of the Polaroid photos that I have done to do the, the reverse engineering. So I use uh, uh, this uh, set of uh, Polaroid using an optical microscope to take the photos. And then I put each photo side by side and I construct a, a mosaic uh, with a total size of about two meters by two meters. And then also with a, a, a lens, I was uh, possible to identify each transistor. And then uh, each transistor got a label, as you can see in this photo. And then uh, this uh, label, I was uh, it's not uh, uh, in the same uh, level of the photo. So I can move this label to see what was under the the label here and then uh, by uh, observing the connections between transistors so transistor was not so difficult to identify because when we see a, a polysilicon line crossing a diffusion one so diffusion here is gray uh, polysilicon is sometimes a little bit rose red or even green and uh, the substrate is the dark green that you can see here and for sure, the, the clear lines here the, uh, are the metal ones. So uh, then uh, observing the, the connections between transistor, I was able to identify the logical functions and so on. Still uh, having uh, the possibility to identify functional blocks, and uh, I was able to identify all the the timing generators. So there is three levels of timing generators in uh, Z8000. And uh, so this is some of the first observation. I don't have time here to, to go deep in all the observations that uh, we got uh, by this work, no? But I'll try to, to give some ones in, in this first part of the, the talk. So here is a. Uh, another detail of the Z8000 control part. So you can see here that the larger metal lines uh, correspond to VDD and ground. And the, this, the, the height of the strips varies. No? So there is some large ones, like the first one in the top, uh, because here uh, we have a large set of uh, metal tracks on the horizontal. and. Uh, a large set of these metal tracks are used to distribute uh, the timing signals, mainly, well, the basic clock, but then the two levels of uh, clocks 
that uh, were divided the, the, the all the time in uh, management. You know? So here also I don't have time to go to in details, but uh, using this Animos technology, and we can say that uh, this uh, part of the control part uh, it mixed the signals that were result of the decoding of the instructions with the timing signals, then providing the generation of the micro commands or micro instructions that were sent by the control part to the data pads to do the operation with the data. So, um, and you can see also here in this photo that the density was impressive. So all compacted by hand. That time also it was used the lines in 45 degrees, not only metal lines, but also polysilico and even diffusion. Uh, so uh, uh, since uh, the observation of the Z8000, uh, there is a challenge that we are working on it. That is how can you do an automatic design of transistors and connections between them automatically with a density so high as we can observe in this old uh, microprocessor. So here is another uh, detail of the this control part. Uh, you can also see here that uh, the density is is quite impressive. Uh, we can also observe sometimes some huge gates that they were located in one position, and then uh, there was a metal line from the uh, output that goes to another location to have a second part of the same gate. So this is something very unique. So, um, and uh, as I told, uh, the same gate, uh, depending where it was included in the forward planning, depending on the fan out and so on, uh, the layouts were quite different as well, the sizing of the transistor of these uh, gates. So, uh, for the ones that are uh, mainly using standard cells nowadays, where we have only normally three options of sizing, so we, this Z8000 was a here a huge uh, set of sizes that were uh, used. Also, we saw several other microprocessors in the microscope where we were able to see some uh, very uh, specific ways of uh, increasing density. So we can see here that the board of the, the contact is in different directions depending on where it was the best one to compact the, the, the layout, as well the use sometimes of uh, a change of uh, tracking of a polysilicon line like here by using a 45 degrees or even 40 uh, or even 90 degrees uh, change of direction. So um, uh, it was interesting to see all these uh, uh, designs done by hand. So here is the a detail of the data pass of the 68,000. So here we have uh, the substrate is a kind of uh, uh, little rose, uh, a little. Then the diffusion is in orange. Uh, the polysilicon is mainly green. And this is a detail, as I told, of the data pass. So you can see some. Uh, parts here that are, oops, sorry, parts here that are uh, uh, duplicated, so corresponding to different bits. No? On the left here, you can see a polysilicon crossing a, a diffusion. So here we have a transistor. So this is a pass transistor to control the input of a signal to this. Uh, and you can see also that uh, the diffusion the design of the diffusion is very well uh, uh, compacted, you know, uh, considering the, 
some ways to increase the density of this uh, layout. Uh, the metal layer was uh, took out here uh, with a nast, so there is still some uh, dark line here that uh, corresponded to the oxide, silicon oxide that was under the metal lines. So you can see where the metal lines were uh, implemented, but they were not here anymore. So all the observation of this, uh, let's say, old uh, circuit is an inspiration to work in the direction of uh, the automation of uh, the design of uh, uh, transistor networks or uh, gates. I prefer to use the expression transistor networks because we can have a transistor networks that are not uh, uh, corresponding to a regular uh, CMOS gate. That means uh, a transistor network where we can have a different number of uh, PMOS and NMOS transistor that uh, can be uh, used in some uh, solutions. But the 68000 was uh, took a different approach for the implementation of the control part. So they use a set of PLAs, but uh, the main uh, area of the control part uh, was implemented by using a, a ROM memory. So this ROM was used to uh, storage the micro and nano instructions. So there was two level of instructions. And here you can see a detail of this ROM memory. On the left here, you have a, a set of line decoders where you have here on the right a, a better detail of them. So uh, I could also talk a lot about this uh, implementation, but uh, let's keep short for today. But uh, you take a look on this uh, detail of the memory line decoder. Now you see here the diffusion was in blue, substrate is gray, and the polysilicon is a kind of uh, yellow and then you have some uh, silicon oxide here that uh, uh, are uh, were under the metal lines that were uh, taken out uh, by using the acid, as I told you before. And uh, it's interesting here that you see some blue dots here. So this corresponded to the buried contact uh, that uh, were used at that time. That the buried contact uh, was the implementation of a contact between polysilicon and the diffusion. As you know, polysilicon is implemented first. So to do a contact between polysilicon and diffusion, uh, it was need an extra step to put uh, uh, diffusion under the polysilicon. So here is another detail of this 68,000, where uh, you can see again that the diffusion has a very uh, uh, different shapes for, for, for them and a very compact solution with uh, several lines, change of track and so on in order to do a more compact solution. Here is another portion of the, the 68,000, another detail. You can see in the right here a set of uh, buses in polysilicon and uh, you can see that uh, they also use the 45 degrees lines to move you to change the uh, direction uh, here is another detail you can see also here on the right uh, a set of uh, best transistors so five press transistors here and uh, also as we saw in the last slide, some several bus lines uh, that use 45 degree lines to change the direction of them. So here is an interesting uh, case. It's part of the data paths, the uh, data registers or register file of the 
6809. And uh, this is the only circuit or microprocessor that I had the opportunity to see where the uh, memory uh, cell uh, that also has six trans transistors. It has a, a transistor working as a resistor in the path between uh, two inverters. And also the sizing of the, the two inverters are very different. You can see, if you see my pointer here, there is uh, uh, this, the signal transistor of uh, one of the inverters and here the other one that's much, much bigger. Uh, and uh, this, uh, the output of the charge transistor was connected to VDD not to the output as uh, is usual with animals. So here, as you can see also, we took out uh, the metal lines and uh, there is still some metal over the contacts and also in the VDD and ground uh, lines. No? So these two uh, trans signal transistor that I'm showing here, it goes to the ground here. So. Uh, uh, so this was the way that uh, was done on this uh, memory cell of the register file of the 6809. So here also is another detail of the same uh, 6809, uh, where you see here a uh, uh, NOR gate. So here uh, we have a VDD. From VDD we have this, uh, this uh, uh, charged transistors here is the output and from the output we have two paths to go to video to ground one by this transistor on the left and the other by the transistor on the right you can see also that the size of uh, both transistors are different so here is a detail of the z8000 so um, a detail of the first level of the decode in PLEA because the, the first level of the decode in PLEA is really a matrix. Uh, the second level is a set of uh, regular gates. So it's not a matrix as in most of PLEAs that uh, are known. Uh, and here is interesting because uh, this uh, implementation of this uh, PLEA uh, only by defining to include the uh, diffusion uh, behind the, the polysilicon, we are constructing a transistor or no, that means storage a one or a zero. So uh, it's not uh, difficult to do the programming of uh, this PLA because we mainly have to just to define the diffusion mask as well the contact mask uh, that is uh, being used to implement this PLA. So here is another uh, microprocessor or uh, that is quite dense. So this is TMS 7000 from Texas Instrument. Uh, you can also see that uh, the density is quite impressive. It was also any MOS technology and also you can see 45 degrees line. So all this uh, compaction was done uh, by hand. So uh, this is something that uh, was dropped uh, because uh, it was started, as I told, uh, using ROMs to the control part like the 68000 and then later the use of uh, uh, the use of cells, uh, but as you, as you know, in microprocessor we don't use a, a standard cell library because when a microprocessor is starting the design by the the, the designer team, uh, they don't have a, a available standard cell library because they uh, are expecting to use a technology that will be available in two, three years when the 
design of the microprocessor will be ready. So uh, they will have a, a cell library by the end of the design of the microprocessor. No? And uh, in a design like a microprocessor, uh, each needed cell is designed. Uh, for sure, nowadays, there is some tools to help on this design, but uh, uh, they are very dedicated uh, ones. So the observation of circuits designed by hand was the inspiration to our EDA tools research. Uh, and uh, the goal was to try to find some solutions that could provide a so dense layout as the one designed by hand in the past, uh, uh, in the time that there was no design automation tools for the design of the layout. So uh, by observing this circuit at that time, uh, we start already to think about uh, some strategies to do the layout. So the first results or considerations were published in a paper in 82 in the Solid State Circuits uh, Journal. And uh, you can see here uh, on the left that one idea was uh, that time uh, the standard cell design that was starting to be used uh, there was, uh, uh, like on the top here on the right, a uh, uh, strip uh, with cells and then a space uh, between this strip to do the routing between cells. So this was the first standard cell approach. And uh, we considered that time that we could bring uh, this uh, routing to over the cells. And then using the same height for the both uh, cell design and uh, routing, by putting this routing of the cells, we could uh, have a, a set, a solution with uh, a smaller uh, size uh, in, the, in one direction, as you can see here. And then uh, doing that, we are able to do the mirroring of strips, like you can see here in this figure three, and this was uh, used uh, in our work here uh, since that time. And uh, some uh, results we have in some uh, publications that were done in the past. Also, uh, to do that, we have established a priority scheme of routing in, in, in the metal tracks. And then uh, doing a kind of uh, mixing of uh, strips with priority to do local connections and priority to do connections between cells in different uh, locations of uh, uh, the layout. And on the right here, you have an example, this figure five, that uh, was uh, in a paper published in Niskas in Finland in 88, where uh, probably you can see here that we have uh, some tracks with very small connections. So, uh, and then putting all these small connections in the same track, we avoided to, to have the need of changing tracks of uh, longer connections that are connections, cells that are not close between them. So all this uh, worked well. And uh, you can see here another example where uh, uh, you can see all the routing done over the cells. So this is one of our uh, tools uh, developed in the past. And uh, this uh, figure here is of a work published in 95 in, in the edition of uh, Midwest Symposium that was organized in Rio de Janeiro. Then uh, it was started to do some uh, experience in design automation of a full layout. So uh, a set of works that were done by Fernando Moraes, Tropic, in collaboration with the University of uh, Montpellier. Uh, you can see the results on the, on the left. And later on, uh, Cristiano Lazari managed to improve the density uh, with another tool that the name was paired. And uh, uh, this also allow us to reduce area, but also a uh, nice reduction on delay. And this was done for several ISCAS benchmark, always with uh, similar 
improvement. Uh, uh, here also, this uh, full block was designed at once uh, using the paired tool. And then the point that uh, was observed is that uh, increasing the size of the functional block, the running time was becoming too large. And then we changed the approach that in place of to do the at, at once uh, the full layout of a full block, to design uh, the layout of each transistor network separately, that then it will be fast, and then using this uh, transistor network uh, generated, that means the cells generated, uh, that uh, are placed uh, using traditional place and route uh, tools. Uh, so uh, going from the past to the present and future, so uh, one point is that uh, year by year we have a huge increase in the production of uh, transistors. Uh, 2017 17 was one sextillion. For this year, there is an estimation that about uh, 10 sextillion. So you see that bar is not uh, uh, proportional. For example, from 2014 to 2017, in three years, there was an increase in the world in, in the production of transistors from 250 quintillions to 1 sextillion, so four times more. So till when we can keep uh, growing this production of transistor? So the production of transistor itself is not the main issue, but the energy to run all these uh, devices. So this is the main issue. Are we going to have energy sufficient to run all these increasing number of transistors. So this is the point. So we need to change our, our approach to do the physical design in order to reduce power consumption. So, uh, and uh, saying this, so how many power plants will need to cope with uh, the, the energy to run this Internet of Things world? So this is a, a major issue. Also, you have to consider that in many locations, the power plants are not uh, clean ones. Uh, so here in Brazil, uh, most are clean ones because it's hydroelectric, uh, solar energy, or uh, now also the wind energy and so on. But in many locations, there is power plant that uh, contribute a lot for the pollution. No? This is another issue. So why optimization is needed? Uh, uh, in uh, nano-CMOS. Why it's a key word in nano-CMOS? Because more and more we have embedded systems and in many stuff, so we see silicon everywhere, and more and more this requires low power. And uh, then we needed to, def to design dedicated optimized ASICs. So nowadays we can observe that uh, most of circuits are using much more transistors than needed. And the main goal is to reduce the number of transistors and connections in a chip. So connection is another important issue. And the reducing the number of transistors, we are also working to reduce the number of connections. Uh, so we see this uh, table from a long time ago. We can see that uh, if you have a four stacked transistor, any MOS transistor and 4P MOS transistor, we have more than 3,500 different functions. And we, if you have a 5 any MOS and 4P MOS, we have more than 28,000 different functions. In a regular vendor cell library, we can find 50, 70, not more than 100 different functions. And with only three sizing of the transistors. And uh, if you have a way to do the automatic layout, we can do any transistor sizing also. So here is a small example that shows the main uh, idea. So we can have uh, this small equation here implemented by four gates, so three NORs and one inverter, and uh, using 14 transistors. It works, it works, it's okay. So many people, very nice works that we can observe in journals by IEEE and conference, they do very nice work, but when they arrive, for example, in the logical level, they have a solution that works and that's it. 
so it's they don't worry to optimize this solution and uh, you i'm going to show you that we can work on this to minimize the number of transistors to implement the same equation so using the old de morgan we can implement this equation by using just one gate we call it a complex or super gate but it's uh, it's not complex so using this we change from 14 transistor to 8 transistor but another main issue is that uh, moving for the solution using these green gates to the or using this one blue gate uh, we have an important reduction in the number of transistors but also the connections between the gates on the green solution they don't exist anymore on the right one so uh, and if you don't have this connection we don't have also the vias that are needed to bring these connections to the metal layer so eliminating this connection we are also improving uh, the congestion in routing and also we are helping to improve routing of uh, a circuit you know so in modern technologies uh, less transistor means less static power and uh, less connections in vias also helps improving routing so physical design should be seen nowadays as the design of a network of transistors and not anymore a network of uh, logic cells from the library i'm not against the standard cell for sure it's a solution that is well proven well used it is going to be used but it's far away from have a having an optimized solution so if you want an optimization of our implementation we need to change our approach and the one way is to have tools to do the layout of any uh, logic so a strong is the one that uh, we develop uh, uh, adriel was Zemer was the main responsible during his phd for that it support transistor folding transistor sizing and many other parameters so we can do the layout of any transistor network so for example this uh, transistor network here or, or cells they were designed uh, in a completely automatic way you know? like uh, this flip-flop also so but the main idea is to design the here in this flip-flop you have several uh, transistor networks no so the, the astron is is able to design uh, larger blocks but the main idea is to design uh, small transistor networks and uh, so here is an example of a multiplier carry save 4x4 where uh, using our approach there was an important reduction on the number of transistor and this was the main reason to a important reduction on power consumption but there was also reduction area in delay so uh, also something to observe nowadays and you have more details in this paper published in radex 2019 is that uh, uh, during the design of this uh, aoi 21 uh, for example if you see the pull up network here if transistor a is connected to the output or if transistor a is connected to vdd there is no difference considering uh, the uh, logic or the electrical network of the circuit but uh, we observed by simulations that there is a change on the sensitive nodes and then uh, we can say that one of these two solutions is uh, the best one considering tolerance to radiation effects so if you want to take care of uh, doing the circuit level hardening uh, to mitigate software errors we have to consider also the transistor arrangements or the transistor ordering here you can see uh, one function a uh, quite a big function that uh, the same function uh, it was changed the transistor reordering exactly the same function you have here four layout solutions and uh, you can see that even uh, the size of each one is different and for sure one of them is the best one uh, considering the sensitive nodes the another one can be the best one considering variability so we have to 
nowadays to consider also these options. And there is also an extra issue is that uh, if you want to complicate the life of somebody that is willing to do reverse engineering, uh, nowadays uh, we can maybe sometimes using different layouts for the same functions in order to complicate the reverse engineering. So uh, I think you're going back to the future now. We can take also some uh, early approach that we have done uh, in the past, uh, willing to do a sea of transistor matrix and so on. But now to uh, do the implementation of uh, placement of transistors and routing between them. So uh, if you have two transistors, as you can see here, if you put them side by side by a button here, we are defining a, a logical end. Uh, so we can construct this logic just by uh, abutment of the transistors. And uh, if you do something similar, but including a metal and a contact between them, we are defining a more structure. So this is a way to do a layout by uh, using uh, the placement of transistor and including some bricks related to metal connections and so on so this is an approach that we are working on also to as an option well another point also is the placement of a monolithic 3d as you should know nowadays uh, in monolithic 3d we can do a p transistors in one level and then the any transistors in another level then a gate is constructed using two level of transistors and then we can do a kind of folding of this uh, gate uh, with uh, the NMOS transistors over the PMOS one. So here there is also a nice set of work to improve uh, the design automation of this kind of uh, circuits. So for sure, not all layout optimizations done in the past using NMOS nodes can be done uh, nowadays when using the nowadays technologies that, that are more restrictive. But on the other hand, there is some restriction also that help us or reduce uh, also the options that we had in the past uh, to implement uh, polysilicon or diffusion and so on. So, uh, but uh, it's still an inspiration, the old uh, secrets designed by hand uh, in order to go through the research and development of tools that were able to do the automatic placement and routing of a network of transistors in order to be uh, able to implement any function uh, and with that to reduce the number of transistors. So concluding, a way to reduce power consumption is to reduce the number of transistors. So here mainly the static power that is uh, related to the number of transistors and uh, a way to reduce the number of transistors is to use a uh, super gate so to implement uh, large functions using just uh, one gate and uh, so repeating again uh, a key word in non-electronics is optimization and we should do optimization in all levels of abstraction in a design system. Now, today we talk mainly about physical design and uh, so the physical design should be done uh, as the design of a network of transistors. That means uh, doing placing route of transistors and, no, and not uh, anymore placing route of cells from a library. Just something else here. If you want to see more photos that I have done in the past, you can go to this uh, web page here from Facebook and then we have uh, several photos there and uh, most of them I put in the acid to take out the metal lines and the one here in the middle in the bottom uh, <laughs> I stayed too much time in the acid so the uh, polysilicon was going out also so thank you very much so we are now open for uh, for questions. OK, 
Okay. Do you have any questions? So I have two questions, Professor. Um, how has the, organ the organization of newer instruction sets impacted in the physical design of the processor in terms of complexity? Uh, I don't know if I understood well. Can you repeat? How has the organization or the architecture of newer instruction sets impacted the physical design of uh, current processor, of newer processors in terms of complexity? Well, I don't know if I understood well the question, but uh, so uh, one point in the definition of the instruction set, no, is uh, nowadays to see uh, which uh, instructions are uh, really used often, no? Because if the instruction is used only sometimes in, in it's not frequent so it's better to, to not implement it in, in the this equation even then for the firmware or something like that then uh, this uh, will reduce uh, the size of the control part and the reducing the size of control part we are in one hand uh, reducing power consumption but we are also improving the speed, no? Because how, as much transistor the, we put in the control part, that means that we are uh, increasing the network of if the NELS, uh, uh, and this uh, represents a, a bigger delay. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we have a, a question from Guilherme Muskie. What are the biggest circuits that you can uh, build without standard cells nowadays? Well, uh, well, in reality, as I told you, the, the biggest secrets uh, we have nowadays are the system on ship uh, with several cores inside. Uh, and uh, these circuits don't use standard cells. Like, for example, if you see the system on ships that are available in a Apple or Samsung uh, cell phone, so they have several cores inside. Uh, they have several hardware accelerators, like in all these Apple uh, system on ship, and uh, they have some specific uh, processor, for example, neural processing unit. So all these, they don't use a standard cell. So why they don't use a standard cell? Because when they start the design of these uh, systems in a very competitive uh, uh, world, you know, for this kind of uh, uh, system on ship, uh, they are uh, going to use, uh, uh, they are going to start their design uh, targeting technology that are promising to be available in, let's say, two, three years when the design of the system ship will be available. Uh, so uh, they design also each cell they need uh, because uh, with this competition, each improvement is uh, very important. So they are going to have a standard cell or a library uh, when they finish the design of the processor. No? So they don't use in the construction a standard cell because they don't have a standard cell. So nowadays, standard cell are mainly used for general ASICs. No? It's a way to speed up the design. And uh, what we are proposing is uh, to do dedicated ASICs, where uh, in the size of this, uh, it's not a, a big deal, no? Uh, so we can do uh, any size of uh, chip using standard cell. And in this case, we could also use uh, the uh, layout automation approach to use uh, to, to design also. Uh, and uh, what is decisive is if you want to optimize solution or no. Uh, so optimize solution means less power. Uh, and sometimes also can be faster, no? Okay. 
Okay, we have another question from Mateus Lemi. Could you explain the effects of reducing the number of transistors in the cells with respect to timing and input and output capacitance? Well, uh, respect to timing, what we have to compare is the timing of uh, the super gate that is replacing a set of basic gates. Uh, sometimes we see some people saying, well, uh, a big gate will be slower than a small one. Yes, but what we have to compare is the set of uh, gates that we are using to do something, uh, including the delay of the connections between these gates. As you know, nowadays, sometimes the delay in the connections are bigger than the delay in the gates. Uh, and then comparing this, uh, we have done a set of comparison. I don't have the table here. But uh, always the use of super gates or complex gates to implement uh, one function with just one gate was always faster than uh, the traditional use of uh, uh, cells from a library. And then uh, where we have also to consider the delay uh, in the connections between them. I saw an example oh, a long time ago also that uh, it was done by Zenazis, a company, I think they were bought by Cadence, I don't know exactly, uh, I don't remember exactly, but uh, their approach that time was to do a design using standard cell, then they saw the critical parts, and then they changed the set of gates from this critical part to just one big gate. And I saw one example where uh, they, uh, the gate that was replaced, the basic ones, was using five uh, serial NMOS transistors and four PMOS. And it was faster than the, the first solution. So uh, using, uh, besides a complex gate, which is smaller, is slower than a basic gate, it's normally faster than the set of gates and connections that uh, this complex gate is replacing. And also about uh, input and output capacitance, also we have uh, done several measurements and uh, this, is not a, this is not a problem in this uh, case. No. So another question from Maximiliano Serdacid. Uh, uh, the fact that the physical design is done at transistor level will affect the runtime compared to standard cell approach. Runtime of what? So uh, I believe that's the runtime com compared from uh, some RTL well, designers. The, 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 the other question, uh, using uh, the complex gate and so on. Uh, it, we are going to be faster than the standard cell approach. If it's related to the design, uh, so oh, maybe, have, maybe, maybe. Uh, if you if you have uh, the design, if you have uh, the the set of tools to do this layout automation, uh, it should be so so fast as the design of a standard cell approach. So the the, the challenge is to have uh, the tools to do the implementation of the layout. And then also the, the set of tools to do the characterization of this layout. Uh, also, we saw many people uh, saying that, well, the standard cell is already characterized. Uh, and when we are doing the automatic layout, it's not. Uh, so, uh, but we can have tools to do a automatic characterization of the set of transistor networks. And nowadays, uh, besides the cells are characterized, the estimation of the performance uh, that in the past was done by only considering the delay in the gates or cells, uh, that time the delay in the connections was very small. Nowadays, as I told, the delay in the connections is uh, normally more important than the delay in the cells. 
and uh, so the the evaluation of the performance of a, a standard cell also uh, needs to do the routing of the circuits to have the right information of the sizing of the connections and so on to have a good uh, uh, estimation so uh, there is still a, a lot of work to to do but uh, if you want to optimize solution this is the direction to to go uh, and there is a space also to revise some uh, characterization tools or time analysis tools that uh, it were done uh, in the past also by our group to cope with uh, this uh, approach no? so uh, any more questions only that we don't have any more questions so thank you professor hayes for the presentation I don't know if we have uh, oh, we we, ha we just have any question. Will the synthesis tool able to generate the right net list for transistor-based implementation as it has to transform the Boolean expression into transistor-based generic net list from Bruce Bruce Wayne? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So nowadays, uh, when you see a full uh, synthesis flow. Uh, uh, when we arrive at uh, the logic level, uh, we have to do the step that is technology mapping. Uh, so, uh, if uh, the logical designers have done a good optimization, uh, they have to transform these equations uh, in order to cope with uh, the functions available in the cell library. So, this step is a step of desoptimization. So, uh, doing the transistor networks uh, design, uh, we are not going to do this uh, technology map step because we don't need. So, we can give freedom to logical designers to do the best optimization they can, and then any term available in the equations obtained from this optimization, they should be implemented by the specific, uh, the related transistor network. So, uh, so this is a, a, a better approach and uh, avoids this, this, this optimization step we have nowadays when using standard cell approach. So I believe that now it's the, the final question. Okay. <laughs> so bye bye. See you guys. Bye bye you all.